Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled Family Seasons. And this is lesson number nine in that series for June 1 of 2019, entitled Times of Loss. I think we all need to, we all we all recognize that if, in, if 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 you live long enough as a family, there are going to be times of loss. So, what are those times of loss? What kinds of losses could they be? How might that affect us? That will be our discussion for today. We always, as usual, would like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for this privilege of gathering together and talking about your word. As we think about these times of loss, may we realize that uh, each one of us is going to experience those if we stick around long enough. May we know how to relate to them, how we can better uh, draw closer to you as those things happen is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Are all losses a result of sin? Death is a result of sin, is it not? Death is a result of sin. And certainly there wouldn't be any losses if Adam and Eve had not sinned and nobody had sinned from their day until ours. So in a secondary sense at least. And talking about Adam and Eve, what happened to them when they ate that fruit? Something dramatic. They felt naked right up front. Why did they feel naked? Yes, they lost their... Uh, Robe of light? Yeah. But the, back to Genesis 1, it says they were naked with their light. So what happened? I am amused about one uh, artist who was asked to draw a picture of Adam and Eve, and the person who was asking them to draw the picture of Adam and Eve said, don't forget that they wear a robe of light. And he says, how many watts do you want? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to forget something like that. Why were they suddenly afraid of God? Have you ever asked yourself that question? They probably realized that they'd done the major wrong that they were well warned about. Mm -hmm. Things had changed. They felt how uh, they felt, and especially about God, because in order to sin, they had to doubt God. Mm hmm yeah. It was probably a guilty conscience, and they weren't familiar with that, and yeah. um, it didn't feel good. Well, the result, of course, was the beginning of death. And, Carrie, I think you have something about that. Yes. As they witnessed in drooping flower and falling leaf the first signs of decay, Adam and his companion mourned more deeply than men now mourn over their dead. The death of the frail, delicate flowers was indeed a cause of sorrow, but when the goodly trees cast off their leaves, the scene brought vividly to mind the stern fact that death is the portion of every living thing. It's from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 62. Today we become so accustomed to the reality of pain and loss and death, sometimes we, we hardly notice. I mean... I don't know who came up with this idea, but, you know, the motto seems to be in news stations, if it bleeds, it leads. So every morning you turn on your TV and somebody's killed, somebody's shot, someone dies unexpectedly, and that's got to be the top of the news. I don't know. I wish we could f figure out how to do something besides that. In some areas of the world, when the cold season sets in and the leaves begin to die, they turn gorgeous colors. We go and celebrate the death of those leaves. What a yeah. change from Adam and Eve's first response, yeah? And yet, if you believe in theistic evolution, you think that's, you have to believe that that was the way it was from the beginning. That there was death, disease, destruction all through the millions and millions of years before, yeah. hypothetically, somebody became Adam and Eve. So. Ooh. Yeah, well, I, I don't have too much time for that. So in a sense, we're back to the uh, leaf colors. We're not celebrating the death. It's a it's a epiphenomenon. We're celebrating the beautiful colors. 
Yes, we Mrs. are. Mrs. Meyer and I went to see some beautiful flowers mm -hmm. this week. Well, so Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. I suspect that the fig leaves in those days were large. Of course, Adam and Eve would need a size bigger than we're used to because they were twice as big as we are. But anyway, then God provided them with sheepskins. Now, you know, we, well, as soon as we say sheepskins, well, we think, oh, yeah, those are the things you can buy sometimes in the shops and they're all perfectly clear and nice and beautiful and they're all tanned just right. Did God tell them how to prepare? I mean, if you skin a sheep and leave the skin sitting out in the weather for, for a few days, it comes hard and cracks and very, very unfriendly to wear. So did God tell them how to tan it and cure it and cut it and prepare it? And Have you ever wondered all those things? And more than that, what, what was available for Adam and Eve to eat outside the garden? Was there stuff outside there just like what it was inside? Or I'm not supposed to have so many questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it probably didn't totally decay overnight. I mean, they went from what you might say full trees and everything. It, it must have gone down gradually, but I think in not so far down the way, Adam had to work for his food. Yeah. Well, the question is, were there, were there trees and all that kind of stuff outside the garden similar to the ones inside the garden? We just don't know. We don't know. Well, we do know that God said Adam would have to start tilling the soil to produce food. We don't know exactly what all that involved, what kind of tools he had. And it wasn't long before Eve had her first child. Have you wondered, ever wondered what God told them about pregnancy and about childbirth and about caring for a child? Did they get any parenting classes? I mean, those are the days when you could walk up to the gate of the garden and talk to the angels guarding the way to the garden. Presumably, I would, I would have thought if you had a question, you would go there and say, hey, I got a question. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems reasonable to me. Um... And, of course, we know that the next story has Cain and Abel offering sacrifices and Abel's sacrifice is accepted and Cain's sacrifice is not accepted and Cain gets angry and he takes his brother out into the field and kills him. Did they have a family funeral? I'm sure I they did. Him. We don't know how many children Eve had had by that time, but I'm sure a number of them. Uh, and the others were probably, there, mi there might have been others already having children. We, we, we just don't, there's a lot of things that we've got, to, we're going to learn when we, when we get to heaven or at some point anyway. Um, did the angels at the gate give them any instructions about what to do with the dead body, for example? Ever asked that question? In our day, we live thousands of years from the tree of life and away from any life sustaining energy it may have produced or provided. So unfortunately, we live in a world where loss of health is very common. So now I ask you another question. We, we live in a community that's focused on health care. We, I think, I heard read once long ago, and I think it's even more so today, that Loma Linda has more hospital beds per population, for the population, if you just count the, the town of Loma Linda itself, than any other city in the world, uh, which is probably true. Uh, this is a huge healthcare care uh, community. So if you look at that superficially, you would think that we're a very sickly. unhealthy population. Sickly group. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we're, we're serving the community around us. Well, the question I'd like to ask, and I would like you to think about this, what would happen in our day if Jesus suddenly showed up? Because we know that in biblical times, he would walk through villages and every single sick person in that village would be healed. What would happen today if Jesus showed up, walked into a huge hospital like the one, what, a half a mile, less than a half a mile from us here, and just healed everybody and sent them home? The, question, the first question I'd like to ask you all to think about is, what would the media have to say? Oh, happy day. <laughs> Okay, 
Would they be asking how in the world this happened? How about the administrators? How about the administrators? Well, I've, I've discussed this with groups before, and I suspect that what would happen within a day or so, the hospital would be jammed full of patients again, hoping that he'd come back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just, just thinking. Well, in describing his earthly, uh, that would be Jackie. I think you've got something about that. In describing his earthly mission, Jesus said, The Lord hath anointed me to preach to the poor, preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. And that's from Luke. This was his work. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by Satan. There were whole villages where there was not a moan of sickness in any house, for he had passed through them and healed all their sick. His work gave evidence of his divine anointing. Love, mercy, and compassion were revealed in every act of his life. His heart went out in tender sympathy to the children of men. He took man's nature that he might reach man's wants. The poorest and humblest were not afraid to approach him. Even little children were attracted to him. They loved to climb upon his knees and gaze into his pensive, benignant face with love. Wow. Marvelous. From Steps to Christ. Uh, there by Ellen White. What would people do? Not talking about hospitals now, but what would people do if there was somebody walking around on earth somewhere that had that kind of power. They could just lay their hands on somebody and make them well. <coughs> they would not get one moment's rest, I'm sure, unless they hid themselves at nighttime or something. Yeah. Uh, wow. And if you if you read carefully in the, the gospel story, you realize that people came from Syria, they came from Jor what we call today Jordan, they came from, of course, all these areas, and down as far as Egypt, people came long distances to be healed by Jesus. Yeah. Well, we know that in the future, if just before the second coming, people will be healing once again. Not only God will be healing people, but the devil will be pretending, at least we have described that he will cause sickness and then he will remove the cause of sickness and they will be healed. So how do you think you would distinguish between a true healing and a fake healing? Well, we're I'd probably have a discussion with God about that. Yeah. Well, in Mark we, we 5... We usually say, by their fruits you shall know them, mm -hmm. but um, how, do you, how do you describe the fruits of someone that's healed? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you would listen to their teaching. He who seeks to do the will of uh, the Father will know of who they're from. I want to I want to point out an important point here, and it just as Dennis sort of started us down that road. If you watch television, you will see people who pretend to be able to heal people, and you 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 if you watch for a little while, you discover something. The idea is if I can hit somebody or I can do whatever and I can heal them, that automatically means you're supposed to believe that I have a direct connection with God and therefore you must believe what I have to say. So the miracle is to prove that I'm from God, right? Mm -hmm. Is that a safe thing to do? To believe people who perform miracles? No. If you do that, Satan is prepared for you. Well, if you read Matthew 5, 24, 22 to 24, 35 to 43, you read the story about um, Jairus' daughter um, that was raised by Jesus. You read Matthew 15. Um, and you can read about the Canaanite woman that Jesus went way off over there to out of his way to heal her daughter. Uh, if you read Luke 4, 38 to 39, uh, you read about another miracle. That one's about uh, Jesus healing many people, but particularly Simon's mother-in-law. And then I want to focus on John 4, 
46 to 54. Then Jesus went back to Cana in Galilee. And what do we know about his previous trips to Cana? The wedding feast. Yeah, he had turned water into wine there. It's about halfway between Nazareth and Capernaum. Right? Jesus went from his childhood home to his ministry home in, in, in Capernaum. A government official was there whose son was ill in Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to go to Capernaum and heal his son. So now this guy, we don't know for sure, but he could have been even a Roman citizen. He's a government official. But he was working for Herod, then he would probably be a Jew. Um, Anyway, Jesus said to him, None of you will ever believe unless you see miracles and wonders. Sir, replied the official, come with me before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed Jesus' words and went. On his way home, his servants met him with the news. Your boy is going to live. He asked them what time it was when his son got better, and they answered, it was one o'clock yesterday afternoon when the fever left him. Then the father remembered that it was at that very hour that Jesus had told him, your son will live. So he and all his family believed. Um, why is that remarkable? It's a remarkable story for one particular reason. Well, this person believed even though Jesus wasn't in direct contact with a sick person. Exactly. In other words, you're saying Jesus has some kind of powers that I mean, there was, remember, there was nothing like radio or television or internet or any of that kind of stuff in those days. The idea, and they used to think that in order to be healed, you would have to be touched by Jesus. That's why the man said to Jesus, come to my house, please, and make my son well. But he believed when Jesus says, go, your son will be well. And Jesus demonstrated that he has power beyond the end of his arm, which was quite remarkable. I just have one worry. Mm-hmm. Someone who reaches out in faith to the God above of heaven, I believe that they can be healed Mm -hmm. in a healing because they're healed by God, Mm -hmm. not by the fake dude that's asking for all your money. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just find it very difficult to make judgments uh, about healings. Because yeah. it's the, I just, anyway. Well, the devil knows that. Yeah. He's going to take advantage of it as much as possible. Yeah. yeah. Thing, and I, I, we're with you. We understand. The thing that amazes me that I've thought of quite often is if we as humans can do what we are doing with people today, brain surgery, heart transplants, and all this stuff, we know that we're a form of life lower than the angels. The Bible tells us that. Why hasn't Lucifer got p- power above what we have now? Yeah. Well, he probably does. Yeah. Well, I think that's something we'll have to but look for. At this point in time, Lucifer wants us to believe, or Satan wants us to believe that he doesn't exist. Yeah. Because as we approach the very end, he will suddenly start working miracles, and he's hoping if we don't believe that he exists, then we have to attribute those miracles to God. And and that's exactly what he wants. He wants us to think that he is God. Well, there's a very interesting thing that's been suggested by a number of scholars. Look at Luke 8, 1 to 3. Sometime later, Jesus traveled through towns and villages preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. The twelve disciples went with him. Ladies, pay no, no attention to this. And so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been driven out, Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer in Herod's court, and Susanna and many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. So who are the supporting cast in this movie? The rich women. A lot of rich women. But the part that I want to point out right now is there's hints, you can't be sure, but there's hints that maybe this Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer in Herod's court, might have been the mother of the boy who was sick, and it was her husband they went to Cana and asked Jesus to heal their son. Just a possibility. We can't be sure of it. It's quite possible. So how do we respond when a relative becomes seriously ill? Some of, we, some of us have had those kind of experiences recently. Right. 
Observe visit them. Uh, what? Visit them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, one of the great ethical and theological questions that has faced Christians down through the years is this. If a family member or friend becomes seriously ill or is perhaps involved in a serious accident and is lying in a coma in a hospital some distance away from you, does it do any good to pray for that person? Well, our knee-jerk response as Christians is, well, of course. And we should do it even if we don't understand exactly how it works. But the question is, how does it work? Is it possible? I want you to think about that out there. Is it possible that God can do certain things for his children, like healing them, when someone is praying about it that he could not do in the setting of the great controversy? Remember, we're talking about Satan's accusations here because of the devil's opposition if no one were praying. That's an important question to me because many years ago when I was doing a master's degree at Johns Hopkins University, I was at a Friday night party that was conducted, was that was held by one of our, I'm sorry, Saturday night party that was held by one of our uh, laboratory leaders. And he just wanted to invite a bunch of his students there. And uh, this is the question that was asked me by someone who was there who had an experience like this and when I got done trying to explain something about um, the great controversy and why that's important and so forth, she said, hmm. And a few days later she said, you know, for seven years I have been asking that question to everyone who I thought knew anything about the Bible and you're the first person who gave me a reasonable answer. Not necessarily the right answer, but at least the reasonable answer. And she ended up being one of the professors here at Loma Linda University. She was not an Adventist, never heard of Adventist before that. But this is her first question. So how would you explain it? Well, I'm, I'm thinking that we as a church believe in anointing in certain mm -hmm. situations. Yeah. But you can't anoint if you're not there. No, but I mean, it's another facet of a same yeah. problem. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And it does work. Well, think now of the story of Job. What an incredible experience. In light of all we know about his troubles, how do you understand Job 42, verse 5? Very interesting. Verse from his words, In the past I knew only what others had told me. So who were his instructors? But now I have seen you with my own... He's talking to God. Now I have seen you with my own eyes. So I'm ashamed of all I have said and repent in dust and ashes. Very, very humble comment. But the question is, who were his instructors? But yet, Job was the one that was right. In the next couple of verses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, we think of Job as one of the all-time saints, right? So who was there instructing him? God declared him a righteous and upright man two times. In exactly. Chapter 1 and chapter 2. Yeah. The leaders of the church at that time were his instructors. Which what was, was, was the name of the church well, in his time? That's what I mean, church <laughs> in the general. Why couldn't it have been angels? Well, there's a possibility. Yeah, maybe. Or God himself. God talked Remember to him. Remember that in, in his day there were no churches. Right. There was no Bible. There were no pastors. Get there? I mean, what? where did his friends, Eliphaz and the others that came and tried to... Yeah, straighten him out? Straighten him out. <laughs> I mean, they had to have uh, some yeah. community. Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, uh -huh. it says the um, sons of God were the ones that were giving the message to the, mess or the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, that doesn't mean all of them were given the right message. Yeah. Well, God talked directly to Abraham. He came and yeah. visited him. On several occasions. Well, look at this comment by Paul in 2 Corinthians 1. Let us give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the merciful Father, the God from whom all help comes. He helps us in all our troubles so that we are able to help others who have all kinds of troubles using the same help that we ourselves have received from God. Just as we have a share in Christ's many sufferings, so also through Christ we share in God's great help. So, what do you think? If you have been through some kind of terrible difficulty, are you able to help somebody else who's going through that same 
prob- kind of problem. And they'll be more receptive if you've been through it yourself. I personally have uh, two members in my, some fairly close family and some more distant related people. Both of them who've gone through, can- well, the first one went through cancer and a little while later, the second one comes down with the same kind of cancer. And it's nice to be able to talk to somebody who just went through it and fortunately recovered from it. Um, so, well, none of us could ever suffer more than Jesus suffered. He experienced not only all the physical torture, the beatings, the crucifixion, but also suffered under the incredible torture inflicted upon his soul by the devil and all his angels. I am sure they did everything they could possibly do to try to get Jesus to give up his mission and go back to heaven. What, Jesus, about, the, what about the pious religious l- leaders, the frauds of the day? Yeah. <laughs> Re- yeah exactly. Jesus died at a very young age after living a perfect life, ministering to others who were suffering. But, but why is, I mean, we're hoping to live in a future kingdom where everything is perfect that nobody will be sick, nobody will die, nobody will suffer in any way. So why do we have to go through suffering to get there? Does that make any sense? Well, Hebrews says that uh, although he was a son, he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Now, suffering is a relative thing. You know, some people, their sensibilities are such that they can't tolerate, you know, if they've never been exposed to certain things, they, they may suffer more uh, in an experience of learning than somebody who has weathered that and become uh, more seasoned. But all discipline for the moment later on uh, seems not to be joyful yet sorrowful, but afterwards uh, uh, you will have the peaceful fruit of righteousness. In other words, there's a process of of going through things and struggling because if you don't it's like with plants if they don't if they get everything they need real easy they don't develop the root system yeah they have to be challenged uh, in order to develop deeper roots okay let me ask you a question in light of that why did Jesus need to suffer couldn't the father have prevented him from suffering God could have easily just put a little fence around him prevented anyone from getting to him. Well, the companion verse to that might be uh, Philippians 2, uh, 8, where mm-hmm. uh, he, uh, he he was obedient to the even to the point of death, even death on a cross. So, And we have abundant texts that say that uh, the cross was, his death was necessary. We don't I, always know why, but... Yeah. I would say, in light of what I know about the great controversy, that it was necessary to prove how evil the devil is. The devil said, if you, if, if you let me at them, every person will, do, will choose to join my side. That was his claim. And when he couldn't get people to join his side, he wanted to, he wanted to get rid of them, to destroy them, to make them suffer in every way possible. And he will continue to do that. And I and I agree with that as one of the things uh, overall things uh, uh, in Romans six. Uh, it's also used as uh, a metaphor or uh, object lesson of the death of the old man raised yeah. to newness of life. So there's this uh, this other element to that that I think needs to be. Dennis, I think you have something that helps us yes, know more I've got about a couple, that. Actually, a couple. Um, uh, quotations. This first one's from Great Controversy uh, 630. Uh, Could men see with heavenly vision they would behold companies of angels that excel in strength stationed about those who have kept the word of Christ's patience. With sympathizing tenderness, angels have witnessed their distress and have heard their prayers. They are awaiting the word of their commander to snatch them from their peril. But they must wait yet a little longer. The people of God must drink of the cup and be baptized with the baptism. The very delay so painful to them is the best answer to their petitions. Now let me interrupt there for a second. Why is that? 
their roots will go deeper, their connection to God will be stronger. Um, they will be and able to give more than... And their opposition to the devil will be deeper. Right, and they will be able to give to others what no one else will have been able to give. Um, okay, want to go ahead? The time. Uh, this is from uh, um, Review 1884. The time of trouble is the crucible that is to bring out Christ-like characters. It is designed to lead the people of God to renounce Satan and his temptations. The last conflict will reveal Satan to them in his true character, that of a cruel tyrant, and it will do for them that what nothing else could do, uproot him entirely from their affections. For to love and cherish sin is to love and cherish its author, that deadly foe of Christ. When they ex- excuse sin and cling to a perversity of character, they give Satan a place in their affections and pay him homage. And we might say <laughs> that's just true today as it will be then. Yeah, exactly. Now, both of those quotations you just read there are talking about what will happen just shortly before the second coming. But like as you say, this is still true. It's even true today. Even true today. And Satan is going to... So basically, and what I... have expression that I've come to use more often now, and I hope I believe it's really true... God cannot bring things to a conclusion until <coughs> the great controversy questions are fully answered. And this is a part of that whole scenario. Well, it's quite likely that many of God's people will die in the final days before the close of probation. Now, we know that no, nobody, none of God's people will die after the close of probation, but before the close of probation. Will we learn anything from those experiences? What do you think? If we okay. see a number of people who are our fellow church members, people, maybe even relatives and so forth, dying, how will we respond in, in light of what we know about the great controversy and what's coming? And like my example is Job. Have we learned anything from the story of Job? Did Job learn anything from that experience? Do you think, yeah? The Jews at the time of the Holocaust, they thought they were God's people. They saw lots of people dying all around them. How is How are we different from what they were? And many of them have become atheists because of that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, was Job closer to God after going through all of that? Yes. Apparently, yeah. <clears throat> well, now the more the bigger challenging question, did Job's friends learn anything from that experience? Well, let me read a few verses uh, which might raise questions in your mind about well, how well they did. Job 42, starting with verse 7. After the Lord had finished his speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, I am angry with you and your two friends because you did not speak the truth about me as my servant Job did. I, I like to imagine these situations in my mind. I'm saying, okay, how would I respond? Here I'm sitting with my fr- a couple, of my, two, three of my friends, and God suddenly speaks to us. How, how would you respond? Now take se- he goes on. Now take seven bulls and seven rams to Job and offer them as a sacrifice for yourselves. Job will pray for you, and I will answer his prayer and not disgrace you as you deserve. You did not speak the truth about me as he did. Wow. And then you go on, and even the verses that follow up, I don't have time to read all those, but even the verses that follow up, you say, hmm, I don't think they still got the message. But not all losses are physical. One of the most serious losses to affect human lives is the loss of trust. And that, of course, applies particularly to those in our immediate families or near relatives. What kind of experiences could lead to a loss of trust in a spouse? Or child? Or parent? Is is it possible for that trust to be regained? And what what needs to happen for that trust to be regained? Are you asking for examples? If you have some. 
When my dad came back from World War II, he'd been sending money home. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And he was over in Europe, and um, he was a fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. And when he got home, he thought that he would have a little nest egg, but they had spent everything of wow. his money. And was this his immediate family you're talking about? His mom and dad. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I'm just. I'm just. That's an example. Those are the kind of things that happen. He pretty just, much separated himself from the family for most of his life, except for... There's a story told that that reminds me of a little bit, yeah. of a, a lady, an elderly lady, who's who worked very hard to give her, from from Europe somewhere, I think Eastern Europe, worked very hard to give her, mo her son money to emigrate to the United States. And he there he was in the United States, so working hard and so forth. And the friends around said, well, surely your your, fr your son is working and must be successful. Isn't he helping you in some way? No, no, no. And she was just really getting desperate because it was hard for her to keep working. She was getting elderly and so forth. And she said, they said, doesn't your son send you anything? Yeah, she, he sends me things and I put them in my Bible here, but they're just pictures of presidents from the United States. Oh, honey. Didn't oh. You know that oh. all this money that he that's oh. sitting here. But she says, I have them here. I'm preserving them here oh. in my Bible. Uh, kind of sad. heart. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of promises in the Bible. If we had time, we would read all of them. First Peter 5, 6 and 7. First John 4, 18. That tells us that uh, there's no need to fear. Love casts out fear. James 5.16 and Matthew 6.14 to 15, which basically prom promises that God will be with us in every kind of difficulty. Whether the problem has risen in a marital situation, a family situation, or even a work or study situation, the promises are still good. Rebuilding trust takes a long, long time and must go step by step. It will require confession, honesty, and living a life that does not lead to further loss of trust. I have personally had uh, some experiences, something like that, um, working with in other parts of the world, working with people who had a very different background, a different training and so forth than, than what I had, and um, they were not happy with the way I was taking care of their sick people and so forth. And what do you do? You have to do what you think is best to what, according to your training and so forth, and... and uh, when you're some of the people you have to work with think you're doing everything wrong, it's 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 sad. Well, for those who've actually managed to rebuild trust after it was broken, their marriage may be stronger, more intimate, more satisfying, even even happier as a result. There are times, however, when trust should not be restored. When would that be? The heart hasn't changed. When the heart hasn't changed, yeah. Okay. One of the certainly some specifics might be, you know, abuse mm -hmm. that uh, you know where w that would suggest that someone is truly malignant in their mm -hmm. in their heart. Yeah. One of the almost unthinkable things that happens far too often in our society today is family violence. That violence might be verbal, physical, emotional, sexual, even active or passive neglect. What does the Bible teach us about those kinds of situations? Well, I remember the story of Joseph. Wow. Here he walked about 50 miles just to try to take some messages to his brothers and hoping that he could bring back news from his brothers to his father. And look what they did to him. And then Second Samuel 13, the story of Amnon and Tamar and Absalom. How sad, uh, you know. And these are these are stepbrothers and sisters. Well, um, I've always often wondered because the people who took Joseph to Egypt had to travel almost beside. His, where he had come from, where his father's house was, where his Joseph, I mean Jacob, was living. Do you think he tried to convince those people? You know, if you just take me over there, you get a lot more for your money than uh, if you take me down to Egypt. Would he have spoke the same language as the slave trades? 
It's hard to know. I mean, that's one of the questions I've asked myself. I don't know. But they're, I mean, only their grandparents were, were the, from the same family, so our great-grandparents, something like that, they, their language shouldn't be that much different, I wouldn't have thought. Well, the story of David's children, Amnon, Tamar, and Absalom, we just mentioned, is almost too terrible to consider. Why do you think that story is recorded in the Bible? There are many stories recorded in the Bible of how bad things went. Yeah. You could go to the book of Judges and such. Oh, boy. So. Yeah. Well, probably this story was recorded because these were two of the top children of Abraham. One of them, or the other, should have been the next king. Children of David. David, what did I say? Abraham. I'm sorry. Thank you, David. Yeah, yeah. So these were, these were people in line for the throne. Yeah. Well, do you think that um, the fact that they knew that their father had done what he did with Bathsheba and Uriah had anything to do with their behavior? Absolutely. Yes, definitely. The sins of the fathers. Well, and worse than that, if you follow the story down a ways, you find out that the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, some couple, two, three hundred years later, were actually sacrificing their children as burnt offerings. I mean, I, you know, that, that's, that's almost too terrible for me to even comprehend. Now, I could see maybe, 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 maybe a father who has a whole collection of wives like Solomon with his 700 wives and 300 concubines and another child is just another mouth to feed to him, it might have been possible to say, well, let's sacrifice this one to keep some God, a supposed angry God, happy. But what about the mothers? What did they think? Well, some of them were the corrupting influences. Yeah? What about the, the, what they do over there in Israel uh, with the uh, people that uh, blow themselves up and then yeah. the family uh, praises them for doing that and then they get money from the Palestinian Authority or some outfit to, to uh, in compensation. So it's it's perverse. Well, abusers need to be helped, and there is professional help available. And we, as Seventh Day Adventists, believe that the body of the, the a person is includes not just his psyche, but his his body and so forth. We are units. So something that happens to the body happens to the whole person. We. And we understand that. And we understand that alcoholism and stress and sexual urges and so forth are not an excuse for abusing anybody. Uh, but there is help. Uh, unfortunately, careful studies have been done on the issues of violence or abuse of children in their early years here in the United States. The results are horrifying. Up to 40% of young girls in the United States report having been sexually abused in one way or another in their childhood. And, of course, you could guess that almost, almost all of that abuse comes from family members or maybe extended family members, but family members. The problem is you can get help if you want it. Yeah. And so many of them either have no insight or they don't want to get involved. Yeah. Well, there's another form of abuse, a form of loss that is self-inflicted. Think of the millions, even billions of people in our world choose, who choose to become addicted to drugs, alcohol, tobacco, gambling, pornography, sex, even food. And those who are addicted seem to be irresistibly drawn to their favorite evil. The best way to deal with those vices is never to get involved with them in the beginning. And Peter wrote a few words about that. Gordon, do you have something about that? Second Peter 2.19, they promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of destructive habits. For a person is a slave of anything that has conquered him. Okay, well, look at Luke 16.13. We'll look at a couple of passages here. No servant can be the slave of two masters, such as a, such a servant will hate one and love the other, or will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Can you be addicted to heroin and serve God? 
Not really. I will leave you all to think about that. There are many things to which people become addicted. Addiction is not necessarily the same as sin. Sins which become habitual can often be addictions. The only long-term solution to this kind of problem is complete surrender to one's, of his one's, oneself and his or her feelings and desires to Jesus Christ. Uh, look at Romans thirteen fourteen and 6, 8 to 13, but I'll just pick this thir- for, first 14 in Romans 13. But take up the weapons of the Lord Jesus Christ and stop paying attention to your sinful nature and satisfying its desires. So what are the weapons of the Lord Jesus Christ? Sword of the Spirit. Okay, that's another... Shield of faith. Okay. Ephesians Helmet 6. Helmet of salvation. Helmet of salvation. Breastplate yeah. of righteousness. Mm-hmm. Belt of truth. Wow. None of those are aggressive, though, are they? Mm-hmm. Defensive. Mm-hmm. Defensive. Yeah. Well... We can be sure that the devil is going to tempt every person he can, he can to maximum capacity. And I'm sure that the closer we get to Jesus Christ, the more he's after us. I mean, why does he need to bother the people who are already completely on his side? So it's those of us who claim to be Christians and want to follow Jesus that he's really after. So how do we, how do we avoid being overcome by him? Keep the Lord ever before us. We need to grow every day closer and closer to Jesus Christ through Bible study, through prayer, through witnessing, through sharing with others of like faith to keep the devil at bay. Well, and and not really having your focus on the devil. Keep your focus on Jesus and... And also, when you pray for discernment to look at your life, do you have fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering? Are you losing your, your gossiping about everybody? And I mean, God will give us discernment if we but ask for it. And we need to believe that He is the giver of all good gifts. And that we pray for... How does that discernment come about? Isn't that through some study? And uh, Take the book of Job as an example. You see what well, sounds like a lot of good stuff there, yeah. but it's God calls them lies. Mm-hmm. So it, you take, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great study in, in, in determining what's truth and what's not. And of course, Jesus came here 2,000 years ago to bear witness to the truth when he's talking to Pilate, you know. And in Romans 3.25 Jesus' death was to show the truth about the Father, demonstrate that the Father is, is right. Mm-hmm. Read verse 26, too. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but I, I, I picked on 25 because yeah, most of the time it's mistranslated. That's no, why I, 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 I picked on that one. It's not a sin to seek professional help if you have some kind of these problems. Um, of course, the worst loss that we, any of us could probably think about would be the loss of a family member. Uh, to the faithful Christian family member who dies, the next instant, what are they going to see? They're going to see Jesus coming in the clouds. But for the people who left behind, or left behind, they're going to suffer. They're going to miss that person. And they're going to recognize what it says in 1 Corinthians fifteen twenty six: the last enemy to be defeated will be death. It's important for each one of us to recognize the stages in the grieving process. The initial shock often is associated with denial. I can remember very well when my father died and my mother died and, you know, they're there and they're suffering and they're breathing their last and you say, you know, you, you just want to say, you're not really dying. Take another breath. You know, and they don't. Jesus, Stokes. Yeah. Yeah. So often we find ourselves absorbed with thoughts of the missing family member. In some places it may take up to six months to get past that. And then for some people it moves into stages of despair and depression. I have a poor gentleman that's a patient of mine that's just mourning the loss of his wife and it's four or five years ago. Uh He's just completely possessed. Um it has all sorts of problems because of he's in counseling and all sorts of things to try to get help. Sometimes we, we feel guilty. We feel angry. We 
feel regret, we feel sadness, we're sometimes anxious. All kinds of things can happen uh, as a result of a, a family member or friend dying. But eventually, we as Christians need to look up and say, thank you God for promise of the day that's coming when death will be thrown into the lake of fire. Well, there's a lot of other passages which we're not going to have time to look at. Uh, comforting passages, Roman 8, Romans 8, 31 to 39, where he says absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from God's love. In Revelation 21, verse 4, when it says death will, will, it will be done, there won't be any more. 1 Corinthians 5, 15 to 51 that, to 57, 52 to 57, talks about the resurrection and the second coming. And those are great promises for the Christian. Remember that Jesus himself promised that he would always be with us, Matthew twenty eight twenty. Uh, Gordon, I think you have some words about that. I Myra, think. I'm sorry. When difficulties and trials surround us, we should flee to God and confidently expect him to expect help from him who is mighty to save and strong to deliver. We must ask God's blessing if we would receive it. Prayer is a duty and a necessity, but do not but do we not neglect praise? Should we not oftener render thanksgiving to the giver of all bless all of our blessings? We need to cultivate gratitude. We should frequently contemplate and recount the mercies of God and laud and glorify his holy name even when we are passing through sorrow and affliction. It's from Selected Messages, Book 2. Matthew 6, verses 12 to 15, talks about God forgives us as we forgive others. What does that mean? Does that mean God's a tit-for-tat kind of a person? Okay, you forgive somebody and I'll forgive you? God's always forgiving. Mm -hmm. I think it's so that we know uh, in portion how hard it is to forgive. We have a good quotation from Ellen White in the next lesson that answers mm. this question. <laughs> okay. Jim, you've got Matthew 18, I believe, 21 and 22. Right. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, if my brother keeps on sinning against me, how many times do I have to forgive him? Seven times? No, not seven times, answered Jesus, but 70 times seven. So it's all right if I if he sins against me 491 times, <laughs> Man, that's I don't have to forgive him. <laughs> that's overdoing it. <laughs> all right, and four, 489 is not enough? No, it's always be forgiving, yeah. I think, is the message. Well, as a church, how good are we at reaching out to those who are hurting? Think of, we're getting ready to go to a close friend's wedding. Can you imagine on an occasion like that thinking, well, I wonder if this couple will end up in domestic violence. Mm. That's too horrendous even to think about. Is there past experience in it? Your past, you know? Terrible. Well, what do we know about Jesus and healing? We've already read something about that. I have another location, another passage here. During his ministry, Jesus devoted more time to healing the sick than to preaching. His miracles testified to the truths of his words that he came not to destroy but to save. Wherever he went, the tidings of his mercy preceded him. Where he had passed, the objects of his compassion were rejoicing in health and making trial of their newfound powers. Crowds were collecting around them. And I, I think about Peter and John later on. Remember, it talks about the man they healed at the gate and he, he goes in the church leaping and bowing and <laughs> praising God. I, yeah, I try to imagine that. What a, what a picture. Crowds were collecting around them to hear from their lips the works that the Lord had wrought. His voice was the first sound that many had ever heard. His name was the first word they had ever spoken. His face the first they had ever looked upon. Why should they not love Jesus and sound his praise? As he passed through the towns and cities, he was like a vital current. Diffusing life and joy wherever he went, is our three fifty paragraph three. Carrie? Yes. The Savior devoted more time and labor to healing the afflicted of their maladies than to preaching. 
His last injunction to his apostles, his representatives on earth, was that they lay hands on the sick and that they might recover. When the Master shall come again, he will commend those who have visited the sick and relieve the necessities of the afflicted. Comes from Mrs. White and Review and Herald. I, we had a very early physician working here at Loma Linda who went out of her way to minister to people in areas around here. And as a result, a hundred years later, her descendants are donating millions of dollars to the university to rebuild this place and to build a new hospital and so forth like that. Just recently donated $25 million to the new hospital. Yeah. Never know. One of the what tri- can happen. Indian tribes, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, imagine the story of Judas coming into the Garden of Gethsemane and betraying Jesus with a kiss. Hmm. Well, it's no question about the fact that the devil is doing everything he possibly can to destroy human beings. Um, there's a story told by Ellen White about the loss of her child. Jackie, I think you have something on that. When thinking of the loss of life, we should remember the passing of Henry White, Ellen White's oldest son. He had contracted a cold, developed pneumonia, and became deathly ill. Ellen White recounts a touching moment with her son, and this is in quotes. When Henry White, our eldest son, lay dying, he said, A bed of pain is a precious place when we have the presence of Jesus. Absolutely. It's hard to see when you've got tears in your eyes. Yeah. And then in December of 1863, James and Ellen White lost their sweet singer. He had requested to be buried next to his little brother, John Herbert, so that they could come up together in the resurrection. Marvelous. He was only 16 years old when he died but he left an endowment born from experience, the presence of Jesus and the promise of the resurrection. Yeah, okay. Well, we're not going to make it to the end of our lesson quite, but you can get it by going to our, our, hand, our get our handout by going to theox.org on the internet and find about some other details about this story. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to have that steadying, constant, dependable reliance that we can have on you for your the blessings of your Holy Spirit, the, the good deeds of the angels and all the ways in which we benefit so marvelously from having the Christian experience that we all know. We ask that you will guide and direct each of us as going through one of these times of loss that they may feel comforted by all that you have to offer as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.